Sorry, I just had a couple of technical difficulties. Uh, my name is Lori Van Heron. I'm the deputy director of the Independent Redistricting Commission. I wanted to introduce our Spanish interpreter first. If she'll come up here and introduce herself. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Erica Newberg, the chairwoman of the Independent Redistricting Commission, and we will dive right in with agenda item number one, call to order. Okay. Is this a little better? Okay, everybody. I now call to order the public hearing of the Arizona Redistricting Commission. Uh, we ask that you follow the Arizona Department of Health guidelines in regards to COVID-19. If you are not fully vaccinated, you should wear a mask in a public space. If you would like to participate from home, each of these meetings is being streamed through WebEx, YouTube, and our social media channels. They are also being recorded and posted on our website at irc.az.gov. If you would like to make a public comment, you may do so by signing in with staff and filling out the public comment card. We have an American Sign Language interpreter joining us virtually and a transcriptionist who will be transcribing every meeting. Please speak slowly and clearly so we have a clear record of your input. At this time, we will introduce ourselves, as I mentioned, Erica Newberg, uh, chairwoman, I will turn it to my colleague. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Shireen Lerner. I'm one of the Democrats, and I'm from Maricopa County. And I believe we have uh, a couple of commissioners uh, with us online as well. Commissioner Meal. My name is David Meal. I'm from Pima County, and I'm one of the Republican commissioners, appointed commissioners. And I did see Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Watchman a little bit ago. I don't know if he's in one of those rooms. <laughs> I believe we also have Vice Chair Watchman with us in Window Rock. Uh, so with that, uh, we have also our legal team. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Mapping, please. Uh, 
Okay, thank you. Now we'll move to agenda item number two, a presentation on the process. First is a representative from our legal team. I believe it's Eric Spencer. Generally speak pretty loud. Do I have to carry this with me as I think? Just kidding. Hey, good evening. I'm, I'm Eric Spencer. I have the pleasure of giving you a, uh, a brief legal introduction. I'll try to make it as painless as possible. So uh, we're here uh, ultimately because the U.S. Constitution gives us a couple marching orders from a redistricting uh, perspective. Article 1, Section 2, the Constitution directs that a census be taken every 10 years, and that's the precipitating event that allows states like us to draw lines. It's been supplemented by the 14th that provides that the allocation of seats in Congress will be based on population. There are also a set of uh, federal statutes that govern how that census gets translated into numbers down to the states. But I'll fast forward. In Arizona, from statehood until about two decades ago, we drew maps the old-fashioned way by the legislature, drawing them in an arguably partisan manner. And a ballot proposition called Prop 106 created the independent commission that you see before you today. Uh, it was ostensibly designed to take politics out of the process as much as humanly possible, at least out of the hands of elected partisan legislators, and turn it over to a, a commission made up of normal citizens. And we've got five great appointees that I think were in the mold of what the framers of this uh, ballot initiative envisioned. There's a time frame in Prop 106 that says the commission must be constituted by February 28th. Of the, of the year that the census is complete, and we were constituted before that, so we got a nice head start, but we were delayed by the fact that COVID uh, inhibited the Census Bureau's ability to collect the information that we rely on, and so we're now in a pretty aggressive sprint, given that we only got the data from the federal government about a month ago. Um, Constitution gives a couple uh, organizing principles to us about how the commission is put together. There has to be a political party balance, no two members of the same political party. There's a geographic balance as well, where no two members can come from the same county, at least among the first four that were appointed. And those first four appointed by the majority and minority leaders of the House and the Senate. And uh, I think, yeah, there's a presentation behind me that shows you the names of who's on the commission, uh, and among the first four, they selected our esteemed chairwoman, Erica Newberg, as the independent and the chair of the commission. Um, but we, we uh, have abided by those party and geographical diversity requirements. Um, in the Constitution, before you see the criteria that's on the screen, there's a requirement for the commission to wipe clean the existing congressional and legislative district maps, which, which we've done. And we've created what are called the maps, which is what we'll principally discuss, although not exclusively, but principally discuss tonight. Since we've gotten that task out of the way, we're now going to focus on the draft maps, which is where we try to apply the constitutional criteria and adjust these default boundaries we've created to actually make intelligently designed districts. And there are six criteria in the Constitution. First is the Voting Rights Act and the U.S. Constitution. These are uh, non-negotiable uh, federal uh, requirements that we comply with and we take them seriously. The next couple, though, are, are fairly discretionary and they're done to the extent practicable. The first one listed are that districts have to be equal. Uh, when it comes to congressional districting, equal pretty much means equal. Uh, you'll see very little deviation in those lines, but under federal constitutional law, legislative district lines have a little bit more leeway in terms of the population deviation between the districts, but we try to get it as close to equal as possible. We also have to make them compact and contiguous, meaning as small an area as we can, and there are various measurements on what compactness means, and contiguous, they have to be connected uh, in some way, to be physically separated. They have back to communities of interest to the extent we can. I imagine there'll be some natural community of interest testimony tonight, but we did engage in a month-long listening tour on communities of interest, and we received 910 
official testimony were provided. Community interest can be anything that binds a group of people together. It can be geographic, political, religious, lifestyle, uh, any of the above. It's any set of criteria in any combination that makes a certain group of people feel like they deserve to be in the same district with each other. There's also a requirement to use some geographic boundaries, existing city lines, try not to split census blocks uh, uh, to the extent we can. The grid maps that we created right now didn't take any of that into effect. They only took into effect county lines, but these districts probably go right through mountain ranges and rivers and, and train tracks and, and, and go through all of these boundaries. But in the next round here, we're gonna up for those boundaries. And then finally, competitiveness. The Constitution gives us a directive to make the maps as competitive as possible as long as there's significant detriment material listed in the map. So we're going to list it in the Constitution. So we're going to undergo a mandatory process to assess competitiveness. And if it can be done without significantly undermining these other five goals I mentioned, then that's what we're charged with doing. Finally, public involvement. You've already passed the test by showing up here, but there's all kinds of ways to participate. We meet in a regular business meeting every Tuesday starting at 8 a.m. You can follow those live on the internet. You can submit comments before the meeting, during the meeting. You can show up to one of these listening tours. We did the community of interest tour. Now we're on the grid map tour. Later we'll do a draft map tour as well. So show up in person and submit maps to us. Um, Mark and Ivy will tell you how to do that, but on our, on our website now is this incredible tool to be able to draw your own map, adjusting from the grid lines that we just created and clicking submit and, and letting us uh, know exactly where you think the boundaries should be. So um, we really appreciate all those mapping suggestions and it just it frankly works easier for us to see your drawing as opposed to just visually describing it. But that's not the exclusive way. Give us all forms of input and we'll take it into account. That's my legal intro, and I'm going to toss it to the mapping experts. So again, my name is Mark Clayhan. I'm with the mapping team. Um, so a couple things that you guys maybe already have seen and heard about, but we have uh, a bunch of tools that are available to you guys uh, as a resident. Uh, so the first one is our social economic app. It has demographic data, 14 different points for the entire state of Arizona. Um, it's out there on the commission's website, and it is available to you 24-7. Uh, the other couple things that we have is you might have participated in our community of interest tour. I know we did have uh, one stop in Mesa. Um, from there, we took your input and we generated an entire community of interest report, uh, which has 182 different community of interest um, that you're available to go look uh, and view online uh, available today. Um, the next thing that we have for you guys is the redistricting system. Um, it's up live, it's loaded with the grid maps. It allows you, the citizens, to go ahead and draw your own maps and your own boundaries for both the congressional and the legislative district. Uh, on the commission's website, you can go to our mapping hub and it has training videos on it. It has the link to get there. The accounts are free. Feel free to sign up um, and submit your maps to us. The last thing that we have that's mentioned there is the IRC mapping hub. So it has all the spots where it has uh, the grid maps. It has information about anything that mapping does. It has links to the training videos again that I said and then that will be the spot where uh, down the road once draft maps are approved we'll host them there. So that's your one-stop shop for everything that's uh, mapping. Uh, on the screen there, there's the different demographics for the social economic app. I'm not gonna go over them. We've seen it once before, um, but they are there ready for you guys. Uh, community of interest report. Um, we released that maybe a couple weeks ago. Um, so. Like I said, that's available. That's 182 different uh, community of interest groups where you can see where there's a high amount of overlap and public comment in a certain area and sort of how it spreads out to the community to a very low input. Um, so it's out there. You can go ahead uh, and explore it. Um, so just so we, we go over what is a community of interest, it is basically an area that where you share economic and social um, 
similarities where you work in common with your neighbor uh, and in your neighborhood. And it's basically this uh, geographic area that you guys define as your similarities. Ah, the redistricting system. So it's available 24 seven. So you're able to go there, like I said, make a free account. Um, you start with our grid uh, as a template. So you pick one, the congressional or the legislative district. Um, you save it and then you can go ahead and create your own maps. As all the, the population numbers in there, all the census data, so that is live. Um, giving you access to everything that we have uh, as the mapping team as a citizen. Um, that, is the, that is the mapping hub. The URL is up there, so I encourage you guys all to go and check it out. Uh, I believe it is probably in the packet if you pick that up uh, at the very back of the room. So a little bit more about our, our mapping hub, I've sort of already mentioned it, but uh, it is available 24-7 for you guys to, um, to go and consume. The new thing that we just put up there today is that all of the demographics and the competitive data for all the districts that uh, are the grid are up there for you guys to go take a look in both PDF and uh, Excel. And I'm going to turn it over to Ivy to talk about the grid map. I said the last uh, slide that we did have uh, is our schedule that's up there as we're moving forward, but I think we're going to have to update that from uh, today's meeting. And before we move to agenda item three, um, I will read the rules of the meeting. Uh, citizens may only speak when recognized by the chair or the presiding officer of the meeting if the chair is absent or has otherwise delegated hearing and administrative authorities. In compliance with Arizona's open meeting law, Speakers should confine their statements to the issue on the posted agenda, which is before the commission. Speakers are also requested to limit their comments to approximately three minutes. In an effort to allow for as many speakers as possible, the commission may adjust the time limits depending on the amount of speakers requesting to be heard. Additionally, speakers are required to follow proper decorum. Speakers must use appropriate language. Foul and or abusive language will not be tolerated. Any speaker failing to follow proper decorum or any other guidelines may be asked to leave. Any breach of the peace or disruption of a commissioned public hearing may be the cause of re report to law enforcement. If someone has already expressed the same sentiment you wish to express, you may say so and your comments will be recorded. This is a nonpartisan meeting. Please do not distribute political me material in the meeting room. Opposing viewpoints may be expressed by the citizens present. As a courtesy, citizens are reminded to address their comments to the chair and the commission and not to the audience present. Please show respect for all of the speakers and avoid personal comments. Remember, the commission must hear all sides of an issue to make an informed decision. At this time, we'll go to public comment and we'll have uh, staff read the uh, first names of the speaker.
you. My name is Gene Clun, and I'm from Mesa. I am with District 25 currently. Uh, I was reviewing your maps and your outline, and I feel that you missed um, and deleted and left out Lacentis and Red Mountain Ranch. I do not agree with your Mesa outline, and you split Mesa, East Mesa, and West Mesa, but it appears that uh, we're, you deleted uh, 10 or 9 Red Mountain Ranch and Lacentis. So that's the line I wish you would uh, Ed Steele, I live in Mesa. One of the criteria that you stated for the redistricting boundaries is to provide boundaries to respect the communities of interest to the extent practical. I can start off by talking about the proposed map that you have right now, specifically uh, district number two. Isolates the, as Gene just said, the Los Endes community and the Red Mountain and all of the remainder of Mesa and in fact the entire metro area. Places those two small isolated units with the entire eastern half of Arizona. Community of interest is what I want to preserve by this map. It's these two neighborhoods. of Mesa to keep our interests protected. So put those two small communities, Red Mountain and Los Angeles, in the Mesa urban area. Second is the community of participation to identify and solve our local problems. Being a part of what is essentially all of eastern Arizona can create a barrier to community participation by the residents. Los Angeles. That is what I want to get to. The proposed map does not provide us with the means to do that. Finally, the legislative district map that you have right now, specifically District 4, suffers from basically the same deficiencies as Los Angeles is pulled out of the rural uh, remainder of Mesa and put in the need to be included with our community of interest by Mountain Ranch, Minnesota School, Christian Church, the convenience, the convenience of access to the freeway system that we have in our area. Be my prayer and asking you that to reconsider naming Los Angeles community and the remainder of Mesa
strange and Christian spirit expressed by the divinity of this woman. I can be truthful. Population different. That's what the Gospels tell us. The topic struggling in the Christian state are dramatically different. Important, yes, and we should pay attention to them, but they are dramatically different from the topic areas same considerations that were the themes of the fight against murder, the diminishing and diminished importance of issues of religion, family issues, homosexuality, our system of representative government systems in the state provides its voters with the greatest opportunity for informed participation. Legislative districts, with their structure of precincts, which are closer to the people, define their elected citizenship participation. It gives and it also gives elected officials convenient opportunities to talk to their constituents. By casting a commission to return a mayor's mesa to the legislative and public districts located. In And next, we'll hear from speakers in Window Rock. Uh, I just uh, received a text that in Window Rock, there's, um, they can see but no audio. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I think it's my husband that texted me at the WebEx. It's not. Okay, if Yuma can hear us, can Yuma start next? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask all speakers to please speak very clearly into the microphone. We are having uh, issues hearing you guys. And our first speakers are going to be Mayor Douglas Nichols and uh, Council Member Gary Knight. Thank you, Chair uh, Newberg and the commissioners for this uh, opportunity to address the, the progress of the IRC. Um, it's great that you're keeping the public engaged in this process. I know that's the intent and the spirit of the original legislation, so I really appreciate that. Um, just a side note, uh, we, we lost the, the volume on the speaker on the grid map discussion, the very last speaker um, from staff. So if there was something important there uh, that might be worth revisiting, if not, I think most of us have read through the grid, the grid map description. But um, understanding that it, it is a grid map and it's done just purely off the population, we just want to take a quick opportunity to uh, talk about the community of interest that we talked about uh, in the first meeting, uh, some of the, the things that we'll be engaged in in the next step uh, with our our military complex, with our veterans, with our ag industry, um, the communities of interest along the river and some along the border. Uh, I think at the at this stage with the grid map, um, I would say probably the existing boundaries are probably closer to where it reflects our communities of interest than anything the grid map uh, currently reflects. And so from that perspective, I know you're we're supposed to erase the boundaries of the current uh, delineation, but uh, that might be something that we hold uh, as we start to, uh, to refine the map for our communities of interest. With that, I appreciate your time and your effort in getting this uh, in place for the, the voters of Arizona, and we'll look forward to staying engaged in the process.
Thank you very much. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, my name is Gary Knight, Yuma City Council, and I also sit on the State Transportation Board, District 6. Uh, thank you for your time. I know it's uh, quite a process that you're going to have to go through to get to the end, uh, but in the end, we'd like to see some, some changes that would benefit uh, uh, the city of Yuma. Uh, right now, the way it's drawn, the city is actually divided into two districts. Uh, we would prefer to see that in, in one district so that the entire community is in the same uh, voting district, con congressional district in particular. Uh, as the District 6 Transportation Board member, I, uh, my district includes La Paz, Yuma, and Mojave counties. And I travel to cities within those counties uh, all the time. And I can tell you that we're all rural com communities, and we have much in common with the river and agriculture, and much more, we have much more in common than we do than uh, with Pima or Maricopa County. So would really uh, like to see some progress made in getting us together with communities that uh, are like in their interests and uh, what we actually do and the fact that we're rural counties. The way it is now, we, we really don't have, if we're included with Pima County and Maricopa County, our, we feel like our vote doesn't count. They, those two counties are such that their population, whatever they decide, it really doesn't matter how we vote, and I don't really think that's correct. So I hope you can, can work on that. But I thank you very much for your time and uh, appreciate you uh, holding these hearings so that uh, we can voice our opinions. Thank you. Our next speaker will be William Bolas Root. Uh, my name is William Bolus Root. That's B O W L U S dash R O O T. And I'm a uh, retired software engineer in uh, Yuma, here in Yuma. And uh, 85365 is my zip. And I'm in CD4 and LD13. Uh, Chairman Newberg and Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to share my views with the Commission tonight regarding the grid map that was generated as the starting point for drawing the draft maps and eventually the final maps uh, for congressional and legislative districts <laughs> boundaries. I'm sorry, were you not able to hear me? No, we can. Please continue. Okay. Um, let's see, where was I? So according to the uh, Arizona Constitution, the process to arrive at these maps is expected to be transparent and carried out in public so that we can feel confident that it's as free from political bias and tampering as possible. I have a several concerns about this process already that I feel are important to raise and give voice to. Uh, first, it's not clear that the mapping consultants actually carried out the wishes of the commissioners when they produced the original grid map. The instructions agreed on by the commissioners stated that the starting point would be the township median of the state and rotating clockwise gathering voters into neighbor, uh, neighboring census blocks until the uh, target number for a district was uh, reached. However, the commission omitted another important instruction, namely that the direction from the census block containing the township median uh, should be the next one. So should it be the one directly above it, 
to the right, below it? I mean, how do you determine what block is clockwise from one that's in the center? That was never answered. So that choice could, uh, could have affected the boundaries and the resulting uh, grid map in subtle ways. But because the commission failed to specify it, that choice was left to the mapping consultants who had an, to act on an assumption in order to generate the maps on time. We also don't know that, uh, how neighboring blocks were combined to grow each district, but they appear to have been added radiating from the starting point. So that's not clear either. The published diagram on the website doesn't tell much either. In any case, the choices they made have never been uh, shared with the public, leading us to question the process that was used to create the grid map. My second concern has to do with the mapping software that's been offered to help adjust the boundaries of the grid map when proposing new districts. It's just plain too difficult to use. I'm an experienced software developer and I've tinkered with it for hours without finishing a single map. If I can't, uh, if I can't uh, deal with it and if I struggle with it, how can you expect the public at large to use it? I doubt that 1% of them would have any success trying to figure out how to change boundaries or deal with the consequent ripple effects, much less how to get their proposed map in, uh, to the point where it's worth submitting, assuming they can figure out how to do that. The commission must be willing to accept maps submitted by other means and make sure that they are input into the system where all of us can see them so that they are not perceived as uh, being disregarded or considered of lesser importance than those submitted through the current tool that was proposed, uh, th that are uh, proposed by extremely savvy individuals or powerful organizations that can afford to hire mapping professionals to promote their own agendas. It's the only way to get reasonable public input. Finally, during the public training on the software, much was made about how individuals could share their maps with others so that they could collaborate. But that functionality is not enabled for the average user. According to ESRI tech support, that must be configured by someone else in the role of an administrator. Although I submitted that information through your contact us form, there's been no response to it yet. Given that Timmins has started, um, stated they will not provide technical support for their product to the public, the people who are footing the bill for their services, I suspect that it will continue to be ignored. In the meantime, there are people who would like to collaborate with the maps in a group. So please ask Timmins to ensure that that capability is enabled as soon as possible so that we don't have to waste any more time waiting. Thank you for your time tonight. And I'm gonna hand it off to, Marie, or, uh, to Michelle over in Window Rock. Thank you, Alex. I'm actually gonna um, let uh, Vice Chair Watchman do this next introduction. Uh, thank you, Michelle, and Yate, everybody. Uh, this is Derek Watchman. We had some technical audio challenges here in Window Rock, and so uh, I'm Derek Watchman. I'm the Democratic appointee to the commission, and I represent Apache County. And so uh, to get the speakers going here in, in Window Rock, I'd like to introduce our Navajo Nation president, President Jonathan Nez of the Navajo Nation, and he will provide his remarks. And so, President Nez, the floor is yours and welcome, sir. Thank you, Derek. Good evening to everyone. My name is Jonathan Nez. I am the president of the Navajo Nation. Uh, and uh, we are coming to you from Window Rock, Arizona. As you have noticed, uh, we do not have the best internet capability uh, here in, on the Navajo Nation. Just imagine how it is throughout rural Arizona. You know, when the census was taking place, there was not that much reliability on internet connectivity, which plays a factor into our discussion today. Uh, so on behalf of the Navajo Nation, I would like to thank the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission for including 
Navajo on the second round of public hearings. Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission commissioners, uh, our friend, our relative, Derek Watchman, vice chair, Erica Newberg, chairperson, David Mel, member, Shireen Lerner, Douglas York. Also, greetings to all the citizens of the great state of Arizona for participating in this very important process that happens every 10 years, uh, reapportionment. During the first round of public hearings, I covered the Navajo Nation's population, the impacts of decennial count of Native American populations, and more importantly, the need for the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission to recognize and participate recognize the participation by those with a diverse set of interests, as well as those who hold a critical stake in the outcome of the redistricting process. As Navajo people, we are the data experts for our own communities. Therefore, once again, on behalf of the Navajo Nation, I respectfully request the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission to recognize the political boundary of the Navajo Nation as a community of interest. And as you can see in these maps, the districts, the proposed lines are dividing, separating the Navajo Nation. And I show one such in the legislative district. Communities of interest, is what we are advocating for and keeping the Navajo Nation as a whole. The, this round of public hearings to complete the grid map adopted by the commissioners on September 14, 2021. This approved grid map is, starting, is the starting point of our discussion with only the following two criteria: equal population, and compactness and contiguousness. Now our participation is to complete the grip map with the other four areas of the Arizona criteria. More importantly, two of the areas are the district shall comply with the United States Constitution and the United States Voting Rights Act and district boundaries shall respect communities of interest. The adopted map for legislative district is a concern to us, all of us, here on the Navajo Nation, and as, of course, as president of the Navajo Nation. This proposed map has the current District 7 split into two districts, 6 and 7. The Navajo Nation is situated within the counties of Apache, Navajo, and Coconino. The splitting of the Navajo Nation into two districts will not comply with certain redistricting criteria. In closing, thank you to the commissioners for the time and consideration of our concerns. We will follow up and we will send, be sending our proposed recommended maps within the timelines uh, mentioned. And that will be our submittal. Thank you again for the opportunity to express uh, our concerns and also include in the public comments. Thank you, God bless. Thank you, Mr. President. The next speaker is Stephen Begay. Thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon, commissioners, staff, and guests. My name is Stephen C. Begay, a Navajo, and an enrolled member of the tribe. I'm a voter in national, state, and tribal elections down the road here at the St. Michael's chapter. Regarding the maps, the base congressional grid map includes Apache and, and the Navajo Nation, the new CD2. The base legislative grid, grid map makes changes in LD6 and LD7. Apache County remains an LD7, which is okay. 
the old LD7 included parts of the Navajo and Coconino counties, but the new base map has the Navajo counties, Navajo and Coconino counties, and the new LD6. Okay, we're having some audio challenges. Hopefully this is short term. Maybe the problem's us and not them. We just lost Window Rock. Alex, can you hear us in Yuma? Yes, we can hear you guys. Okay, Alex, we're gonna throw to you okay. and then try to fix the issues in Window Rock. Okay, awesome. So uh, the next three speakers will be uh, Nancy Meister, Phil Townsend, and Wade Noble. So Nancy, please come up. Good afternoon, commissioners. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. My name is Nancy Meister. I am a third generation Arizonan and have lived in Yuma for over 40 years, 35 in the same neighborhood. I am here to support uh, a legislative district that encompasses most of Yuma County, the Tohono Ono. I know I'd do this wrong. Tohono Ono. Oda um, <laughs> Reservation, and some parts of uh, Pima County. Although this stretches across much of the southern boundary, it would connect majority minority voters who share common interests, such as having family and economic ties on both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border, and to have similar voting records. Geographically, it is large, as in the case of, I can hear myself, back. Um, in the case of rural counties, to balance the population requirements, but much of the territory is the Barry Goldwater Bombing Range, the Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge, and Organ Pipe National Monument. Therefore, it contains few, if any, human residents. Latinos and Native Americans in this geographical area that I've described are minorities under the uh, VRA and the 14th Amendment who must have the right to elect representatives of their choice. I recommend the district begin at the Colorado River and include um, all the way to South Tucson to provide the required number of people for a legislative district. Its northern boundary should be around uh, Interstate 8. And I will be submitting a map, but need more time to master the mapping tool that you have provided us. It is a, a challenge. Currently, Yuma County has two legislative districts, which I believe have really benefited us, as we have six state representatives who represent us at the state capitol and our particular needs um, in the legislature. Thank you for the work you are doing on behalf of Arizona. Chairman Newberg and members of the commission, my name is Phil Townsend, and I'm a Yuma resident. Um, thank you for this opportunity to address you today. Um, realizing that this grid map is just the beginning, uh, I just wanted to reiterate that um, uh, many of us here in Yuma are very content with the way Yuma is currently divided, having two uh, legislative dis districts representing Yuma and two congressional districts that represent Yuma. Uh, this gives us a, an opportunity to have uh, a larger voice in both the legislature and Congress. Uh, the current uh, legislative district does come into Yuma County along the Barry Goldwater Range line, 
then down uh, County 14th uh, to Avenue D, up Avenue D for a while, and then back up 24th. It's easily adjusted to fill in the numbers that you may need to to get the numeric uh, calculations, that, that, that adjustment. But it does give us an opportunity to have multiple uh, representation uh, out of Yuma, uh, both uh, in the Democrat and Republican Party. It gives a uh, great voice for us, and uh, our legislators have been known to work extremely well together to represent Yuma County. So I would urge you to look very hardly, hard at the current uh, district lines uh, and perhaps maybe just uh, adjust them uh, as you might need to just uh, to, to get your numbers at, uh, correctly because it does work very well for us. Thank you for this opportunity and I appreciate this that you're uh, giving us in, here in Yuma an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners. Again, we appreciate your effort and your work. Uh, we recognize that it's a lot of commitment to serve in this particular capacity. My name is Wade Noble. I'm a longtime resident of Yuma. Um, wasn't born here, not a native. I have five children who were natives. They were all criminals. Uh, they've served their time and left Yuma some time ago. Um, but while we have been here, I have been had the opportunity and privilege to see Yuma change. I've been here when it was a district. I've been here when it's been two. Uh, and we ask you to listen carefully to those that will come to you and say, we like the way it is. Look at those boundaries and see how they work. I guess there's a little bit of contrast in saying, well, we're here to support our community. We want to have a, a community interest. We want to have single communities. We want to have the ability to be in a group together. And then we say, we like two districts. Uh, and frankly, those two districts are somewhat different politically. But in having those two separate ish districts, it makes it possible for us to have, as previous speakers have told you, additional representation. We're able to work with those who are elected in each position, and we are satisfied, and in fact, happy with the representation that we are, are getting. Uh, as you've also heard from others, and I want to reiterate it, there are significant community of interest dealing with national defense and the bases that are uh, within our area. We're able to represent them together. And we ask that based on the idea that it's been working and that's no good reason to change it just because it's working, we ask you to really consider that and hopefully you'll be able to see a way to keep this area, generally speaking, in the same configuration that it is now. Thank you. And I'm going to hand it over to uh, Marie and Mesa. Thank you, Alex. I have two remaining speakers. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Leslie Wilson, and I live in LB25. Um, one, a lot of the points have already been made, so thank you for everyone who did that. But, um, you know, there's been a lot of effort put into this project, a lot of money, time, that sort of thing. And uh, the data was taken from the 2020 census prior to what we're seeing happening at the border right now. So something that popped into my mind was that all of this will be set based on that data, but now we're going to have people who are voting who are not legal. And so the... I don't know the answer, but um, the, the things are going to be very skewed at that point, and it's just something to think about. Um, we we have people who are settling here with their family. You know, many are going to other other states, um, but there will be people here in, in who settle in Arizona who are not documented, and they will be voting. We we see that happen um, this last time. So, um, just something that I would like to make you you know bring up and and make a point of. So, thank you. My name is Daryl Covert. I'm the chairman for LD17, which is part of 
Gilbert, Chandler, and Sun Lakes. I'm a born native here in Arizona. I wanted to come to you today and help consider a few things on a very hard job that you guys are doing. I see that you arbitrarily put a line a McDowell straight out, and a few of them have already mentioned about that. I'm not going to delay on it too much, as far as the Lacendas area and as far as the Red Mountain Ranch. But also take into consideration anything that is residential south of the Tunnel National Forest that goes to the McDowell Mountain, uh, McDowell Road area. That needs to be in the new Congressional District 3. I also wanted to talk to you about redistricting and re -precinct. Right now, our precincts in a lot of places are very, very large. Bolton Ranch right now is 7,500 voters and is way, way too big. But the problem is, is it also includes an area that is called Ironwood. This is a walled-in 55-plus area that has no way in which you can get into Bolton Ranch, but is included in that. It actually should be part of the Sun Lakes Palo Verde and Cottonwood area. Why it was decided to put into Fulton Ranch, I have no idea, but the demographics and the needs and desires of the population in Ironwood is totally, totally different, and that needs to be considered. Also, looking at the new map that was on it, it took in a part of the Gila Indian Reservation, which has no residential in it at all, but if it did, the needs and desires of the Indians that are on that reservation are totally different and dynamic than the residents that are in Chandler. Uh, the old line, which was up the 101, or the alignment with the Price Road, should consider, be considered and continue to be that way on it. My biggest concern with both the new LD12 and the LD13, uh, which is what 17 is now, Instead of considering it in the cities, you've divided it up. I'll give you an example. When you go on the west side of the 101, you guys took in a population area in it to get your numbers up, but you included the Kyrene School District. So instead of having two school districts involved, which would be the Chandler Unified School District and the, the Gilbert uh, School District, you're now including the Kyrene School District. So get your numbers from somewhere else would probably be a wise decision at that particular point. Rather than trying to get the numbers equal, try to get it to represent the voters that are in that particular area. Not only that, both the LD13, the new LD13, and the new LD12 divides up both Gilbert and Chandler, terribly down through the middle. Now, I was under the understanding that we were trying to be able to have this be a situation where if we had votes that are going to be done, questions in Gilbert, or things in which they're going to be answered in Chandler, that we'd be able to have that situation where the people would be concurrent. What you've done is completely split it up, and it's worse than it was before. So I appreciate you taking a few efforts. I just looked at the map for an hour and came up with those ideas. And I'm sure you guys have a lot more ideas involved. But I appreciate it if you would consider those things. Thank you very much. Thank you, speakers. And we will next go back to, is it Window Rock? We will next go to Michelle in Window Rock. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners, staff, and guests. My name is Stephen Sebegay, a Navajo and enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. I'm a voter in national, state, and tribal elections down the road here at St. Michael's Chapter in Apache County. Regarding the maps, the base congressional grid map includes Apache County and the, Na the Navajo Nation and the new CD2. The base legislative grid map makes changes in LD6 and LD7. Apache County remains an LD7. The old LD7 included parts of the Navajo and Coconino counties, but the new base map has the Navajo and Coconino counties in the new LD6. The changes on the base map show boundary changes and that can be commented from those respective counties. counties. For 153 years now, the Navajo people have lived under the signed treaties and agreements with the, Nav the, Nav with the United States. The people have established laws similar to the nation and state laws. In 1948, the American Indian people gained the right to vote. Before that, many folks did not vote for their state legislators. With the education and exercise 
about their voting rights. Recently, many Native American voters have made a difference in the county, state, and national elections. Their participation made the election process more competitive in the outcome. The Navajo government has codified its laws to exercise its authority and its sovereignty. The treaties and agreements appear to have compacted the people geographically and politically. The nation and the national and state laws are separate. The communities of interest are shared by many Navajo communities. Land statuses include treaty, public land, allotted, and other types of lands. For mapping, the raw resources and raw materials like sand and gravel are used for roads throughout the reservation, but access to it sometimes require additional federal approvals. The federal tribal and industry cleanup of the abandoned uranium mine sites on Navajo lands is an interest of all residents. Other resources like water are constrained, but the people share those at large. The redistricting process should allow for the communities of color to have an opportunity to, to give input into the mapping and redistricting process. I'm, an, I'm a volunteer in my community to participate in the redistricting process and to help move forward towards a fair and competitive election process. Thank you for listening to my statement. The next speaker is Leonard Gorman. And then after Leonard Gorman is Lenora Fulton. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, three different points. Um, the grid map for LD7 first, and then the second one is the CD1, and the final one is the technology interface. <clears throat> the first is the, the grid map for LD7. The paramount concern that you have to a hurdle is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it's an important facet of the redistricting activities that carry on throughout the country. It's gonna be a challenge. We have to be creative in settling the concerns about the VRA. LD7 currently has a 63% Native American voting age population. And some data indicate it's higher than 63%. You are saddled with the responsibility to achieve the 63% Native American voting age population. How do we do that? It's important to be creative in this situation. The two split, uh, the two district six and seven in the grid map are unacceptable. You need to start off with the current configuration of LD7. That's the place to start. So scrap LD6 and LD7 and start off with the original LD7. That will begin the process to achieve the 63% Native American voting age population. Such suggestions are on the west side at Wallapai, on top along the state line at Paibab, okay? Cut out as much as possible uh, the non-Native American population. Uh, ensure that both um, White Mountain and San Carlos are in LD7. Uh, that will begin the process of getting you close to the 63% Native American voting age population. The second part, CD1. Again, CD1 is unacceptable. We have to look at the current configuration of CD1. Uh, at the Hualapai in the on the west side, the Kaibab. And then I think a point was raised earlier from Yuma as far as the Native American communities in the suburban area of Phoenix. I think it's important to begin the process of assessing. Uh, the suburban area in Scottsdale, um, Phoenix area to seriously consider uh, the need to reach the current 23% Native 
Native American voting age population in, in CD1. That's your threshold. Uh, otherwise, for both LD7 and CD1, if you go below 63% for LD7 and 60, 23% for CD1, we're seriously considering retrogression issues. Uh, those are the two factors for the legislative and congressional district. Uh, the, the prospects of being creative is looking at the Toro Orem as a part of the congressional district uh, and creating that J map uh, running along the Cochise uh, County and picking up uh, TO. I mean, that's, that's being creative. The final point that I want to raise is the technology interface. I think there's already been points raised about that. <clears throat> if you're using the dis district turf as your public interface, it is a very uh, much uh, complicated uh, interface. Uh, it does not pick up the um, blo uh, block blocks across the state. I, I think it's, it's easier to work with the voting districts, but the voting districts are a disservice to the communities across uh, the state of Arizona. Uh, so, and finally, the Navajo Nation is using the Maptitude uh, software. Uh, we need to be able to interact with the, the Independent Redistricting Commission uh, sending shapefiles to the commission. Uh, the district church does not accept uh, the shapefiles from, as I understand, on the New Mexico side, shapefiles from Maptitude. And it's very difficult to work and interface with this technology. So with that, um, let's be very creative for CD1 and LD7. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, and the commissioners and staff. I am very pleased to be here this evening in Winter Rock to express my views on what has been discussed in this hearing. One of the things that we say as Navajo people is our clan. We have four clan system. I am Honeycomb Rock, born for Red Streak running into the water, and my mother's father is towering house. My father's father is Edgewater. So we are all related as a nation. And this is how we interact in any setting, whether if it's political or in voting. And one of the things that um, I'm looking at is a concern. This uh, legislative district seven that we currently have is something that took a long time to get to this place. This is where the people are happy. We are one unit. The Navajo Nation is a large community. The reservation, as people always say, is the size of West Virginia. And so we as a people, since time immemorial, according to our culture and our clan system, that we Navajo women are a matrilineal society in our community, in our nation. And so the consent of the women in our community years ago saying that this District 7, the way it is, is acceptable. Now to divide the nation, but to have six and seven being divided, that is, that, that is devastating to us. It is like dividing your family. It's like taking mom and dad apart and the children are out there wandering around. This is not acceptable. So we are asking that we have uh, the map reviewed and that we have uh, the community of interest be really looked at deeply because the political boundary is, is similar to that. So one of the things that um, I'm asking for the commissioners is to take some of these comments that are being made into serious consideration, our Navajo Nation president, and we have people that are volunteering, you know, out there in the community to try to educate the people. And so to include other Native American in the maps is very important as was stated. 
And so this is my comment, but I would like to say that we need to have consensus of the people being one nation. The Navajo Nation is a very large voting block. We work many, many years to bring our numbers together and to divide and to divide our nation is something that is not, not good for us. It's very detrimental. And I know that the people are affected. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to address the commission. Thank you. Next, we'll throw it back over to Yuma. Alex. Thank you, Michelle. Our uh, next speaker is Jackie, Kra uh, Jackie Kravitz, Lynn uh, Pinkrazi, and Jesus Alago. Good evening. My name is Jackie Kravitz and Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I've lived here in Yuma County for over 25 years and I am um, unhappy with the current grid maps. And although I know the grid maps are just a starting point, I want to urge the Commission to adjust them because they currently don't address the varying needs of Yuma County. Yuma County is as diverse as Arizona itself. We have rural and agricultural interests, urban interests, logistical city issues, and suburban infrastructure to maintain. Having two districts of legislatures in Yuma County allow our vastly different interests to be most fairly represented. Maintaining two voting districts ensure better representation for both our rural agric agricultural interests and our large Hispanic population. Our maps are supposed to uphold the promise of the Voting Rights Act and protect the voting power of communities of color. The southern half of our district is about roughly 60% Hispanic. By combining all of Yuma County into one district at the congressional and state legislative level, the voting power of that community of color is diluted. Our maps should reflect our county's diversity and allow our elected officials the ability to effectively represent these different interests. The bottom line is continuing to allow the greatest representation for all the people of this great state. And that is why I urge the commission to maintain two legislative and congressional districts in Yuma County. Thank you very much for your time. Good evening, I'm Lynn Pancrazy. Um, I am the county supervisor for District 5 here in Yuma County. And uh, first of all, let me thank the commissioners for their service. It is a lot of work that you guys are doing and we appreciate it very much. Now, um, I was born and raised right here in Yuma County and I had the, uh, um, the honor of serving as uh, the first District 4 Senator when those districts were uh, created. And I can tell you that Yuma County is very well represented at the legislative and congressional levels by having a split. We have such a diverse community that with both two congressional districts and two legislative districts in Yuma County split basically the same way they are now, we are able to get the representation that um, we would like. And Yuma County is, is unique in that we have always been a county that has been able to work together, regardless of party. And we have done that with both our legislative and our congressional districts the way they are now. And we would very much like to keep them that way. So um, as you guys are, are working on, uh, on your maps, the, the way they're drawn now, and I know this is just the grid map, um, they don't represent us to the best degree. The maps that we had that divided us, divided you men into two legislative districts and two congressional districts really worked well for us. And uh, we would appreciate you looking into that and if at all possible, um, creating those two districts again. Thank you. Did you want to speak, sir? No? Okay. Um, hi, Chair. Uh, my name is Jesus Lugo from uh, <clears throat> District um, Sub County. 
I'm a PC from District 28. And my, my uh, every time I think about it, um, everything you guys gonna be changing, it's not only the districts, it's uh, uh, the list, the working list, people, thousands of the people know where they're gonna be voting and what district they're gonna be voting, they know already. So everything gonna be changed and it's gonna be more hard for volunteers to be walking in the districts. But I like to, everything to be the same like it is right now. Thank you. That is all that we have over at Yuma. I'm gonna hand it over to Madam Chair Newberg. Okay, I presume, is that our final speaker in all three locations? Fabulous, well, thank you everybody uh, for coming and engaging and doing your civic duty. Uh, we will now move to agenda item number four, which is adjournment. Rather than relying purely on our interpretation of your comments today, we encourage you to go online and submit a map to us using our mapping software at irc.az.gov. This will ensure we correctly understand the definition of your community. Please encourage your friends and neighbors to share your thoughts and their thoughts too. Anyone can do so online anytime. There's no requirement to attend one of these meetings to be heard. And before we adjourn, let me emphasize for those who are having difficulty navigating the mapping software we can read hard copy maps. You can do it the old fashioned way. You can literally just draw a circle. You can write boundaries, mail it to our address, and we will collect all of that data. With that, we will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much for attending.